Welcome to The Poisoning, a podcast by AFP. Episode 5, Exile. I'm Andrea Palaciano. And I'm Jonathan Brown. We're journalists working for the global news agency, AFP. Me and my family, we didn't even have any plan and, and any intent or desire to leave Russia. And there was never even on the discussion uh, as early as the beginning of this year. All of the prominent opposition figures were arrested back then in late January, early February, and I understood that somebody has to stay free. This is Vladimir Milov. He's a well-known Russian opposition activist. He's a key ally of Russia's most prominent opposition figure, Alexei Navalny, who was poisoned in a serving time in jail. In the early 2000s, Milov was briefly deputy energy minister. He's describing an experience that is becoming common among critics of President Vladimir Putin. Exile. I found so many police at my doorstep that I've actually never seen before. There were like 20 people waiting for me for the whole day, since 8 in the morning until uh, 10 p.m. for several days, and uh, had a very narrow window of opportunity. It was like now or never. In the spring of 2021, Milov made a split-second decision to leave. And we decided that we better relocate uh, to Lithuania for safety, Uh, So I think it was unpleasant but necessary because the goal of authorities was to completely isolate us. It's not just Milov. In episode one, you heard Ivan Pavlov, the lawyer who defended Navalny's organizations. He fled to Georgia. Many others from Navalny's team recently fled to a host of other former Soviet and Eastern Bloc countries, like Estonia or Bulgaria and Lithuania. It's in the Lithuanian capital, Vilnius, that our colleague Sarah Lulepers met Milov. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Vilnius, our local time, 9 in the evening. The outside temperature plus 22 degrees Celsius. And Sarah Lou asked Milov, why Vilnius? Because it's a convenient place for operations. I have to say that Vilnius is also extremely convenient because of very good infrastructure, like mobile internet is like one of the best in the world here. And so, so it's, uh, in terms of concentration of uh, important opposition figures and political players, arguably it is the leading place uh, at the moment. Milov says that every day in exile, he's busy talking about Russia, both to Russians and to the world. Oh Yeah, basically, as we say, I live on Zoom, uh, so I'm both... Uh, delivering a political message to Russians at home and also meeting a lot of people who are in absolutely different time zones, trying to update them uh, what's going on in Russia and uh, discuss a potential response to Putin's activity. Uh, There is a great time difference. I also write a lot of uh, papers uh, and uh, we're writing the scenarios for our videos and streams uh, on uh, Navalny Live and my own YouTube channel. So (laughs) my typical day is uh, crazy. (laughs) Milov and other Kremlin critics were fleeing a historic crackdown in Russia. After Navalny's arrest, it accelerated, leading up to the elections for parliament in September 2021, and even continued after. Before the September elections, most candidates close to Navalny were barred from running. Here's what one St. Petersburg resident had to say about the vote. Basically, this isn't an election. People don't really have any choice. There aren't that many parties or candidates to pick from. The vote was held online and in person over three days. After the polls closed, videos flooded social media showing ballot stuffing. Controversy surrounded the online count. Navalny, from prison, urged supporters to back candidates who could defeat pro-Kremlin politicians. But the authorities fought back, demanding that Google and Apple block online lists of candidates he endorsed. Putin's party, which was deeply unpopular before the vote, won a landslide. Putin said the vote was transparent and thanked Russians for participating. I would of course like to address special words of gratitude to the citizens of Russia. And thank you for your trust, dear friends. (laughs) 
largely Putin feels that uh, he's been allowed to get away with most of the stuff that he had done. Here's Milov again from Navalny's team. It means that we might expect further escalations, further aggressive, unlawful acts, uh, which will be extremely disturbing for the, the global community and destabilizing the world order if no serious containment uh, is taken on the part of Western democracies. One Western containment strategy has been sanctions against companies and sectors of the Russian economy, but also individuals for election meddling, the war in Ukraine, for supporting the Syrian regime, and for the poisoning of Navalny. While the sanctions have had some effect, the Russian opposition thinks it's not enough. Vladimir Karamurza is an opposition politician who described poisoning symptoms in previous episodes. When Andrea met him in Moscow, he told her he had a specific proposal. The only thing we do actually want from our friends and partners in the West is to stop enabling the regime of Vladimir Putin, is to stop being complicit in the kleptocratic system that Vladimir Putin has built here in Russia by continuing to allow the cronies and the oligarchs and the key figures of the Putin regime to use Western countries, Western banks, Western financial institutions as havens for the money that they are looting here from the people of Russia. Because this is what's been happening for years. The people who are in Putin's close circle, the the top high-ranking officials and the oligarchs, the Kremlin wallets, as, as we call them, they've long made a habit of violating and undermining the most basic norms of democracy here in Russia and then enjoying the fruits and benefits of democracy in the West, because it's in the West where they have their second homes, their bank accounts, where they spend their holidays, where they send their wives and their mistresses on shopping tours, and so on. They've made a habit of stealing in Russia and then coming to spend that stolen money in the West. And this is complicity. By allowing these people to do this, Western democracies are in effect enabling the continuing function of the Putin kleptocracy, and this needs to stop. Some European Union countries are sympathetic to the opposition's calls for a tougher approach. Lithuania is a good example of an EU country that opposes Russia. Geography and history play a big part in that. Some Eastern European countries were, in fact, part of the Soviet Union, often reluctantly. In Lithuania, for instance, which borders Russia and where Navalny's allies have found refuge, many people have painful memories of Moscow's rule. In Vilnius, Seralu visited the former headquarters of the KGB, the Soviet Secret Services. The building is a museum now, where you can see cells in which Soviet dissidents were detained. What you're hearing now is the music school outside the former headquarters. In the 1960s, prisoners couldn't see the streets, but they could hear the music, just like us. In the museum, Sarah Lou met with a professor of clinical psychology at Vilnius University, Danute Gailiene. She studies the impact of this period on Lithuanians. Many people and many families remember this time, and it was very terrible. Galiene says the collective memory from this period informs Lithuania's stance on Russia today. It's so close to us. We know it. We remember. We experience it for five decades. Propaganda, lie. We know. They love dictators, aggressors. They love when you are too polite, too diplomatic. They are happy. They think you are weak and you are a little bit stupid, naive. But we experienced it. And so we think democratic countries, we have to be quite strong with it. With dictators, we have to be united and strong. In Europe, Moscow's critics say there is good reason to be afraid of Russia. There's the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine in 2014. Later that year, A plane crashed over Ukraine, killing hundreds, mostly Dutch, citizens. Evidence suggests that it was downed by a Russian-made missile. Then, in 2018, there was the poisoning attack in Salisbury, targeting a Russian former double agent, Sergei Skripal. That attack left a UK citizen dead. 
Not to mention allegations of Russian meddling in Western elections, like in the U.S., in France, and most recently in Germany. Russia says such accusations are unfounded. Pyotr Tolstoy is a senior figure from Vladimir Putin's United Russia Party. There are many accusations, but I can tell you that when you accuse someone, you should have evidence. For example, in Mr. Navalny's case, we have never seen proof from the West, only accusations. It's the same with Skripal and Great Britain, so we can accuse one another for the next 20 or 40 years, but in my opinion, it's better to have evidence when accusing someone. Some officials in Europe are hesitant to go as far as the Russian opposition or other EU states want. Jacques Maire is an MP in President Emmanuel Macron's party in France. He's been investigating Navalny's poisoning in 2020 for the Council of Europe, an international organization of 47 countries. Yes, Europe and Russia are at odds over many issues, but still, he says, there are shared interests. Russia is still a fundamental geostrategic actor. It's a partner on European security, anti-Islamist terrorism, and the climate, etc. So the potential for cooperation is broad. There are areas of confrontation, but obviously there is room for cooperation. Tolstoy, the senior official in Putin's party, also thinks Europe has no choice but to keep dialogue open with the Kremlin. You can't cut dialogue with Russia. It's impossible. Russia is the second nuclear power in the world. It is the largest country in Europe. So you can't solve any issue in Europe or in the world without Russia. And everyone, all politicians around the world who are more or less responsible, understand this very well. This stance was on display in August 2021, when Angela Merkel went to visit Moscow one last time as German Chancellor. The visit came shortly after the EU had failed to agree on holding a summit with Russia. In Moscow, Putin greeted Merkel with a bouquet of flowers. She did call for Navalny to be released, but she also called for continued dialogue with Russia. I once again called on the Russian president to release Alexei Navalny, and I also made it clear that we will continue to follow this case closely. Even if we have deep disagreements, we are talking to one another, and it should stay that way. While Navalny's aides work on from Lithuania, there are plenty of opposition-minded people still in Russia. But what's next for them? Viktor Muchnik is the chief editor of TV2, an independent news outlet in Tomsk, the city in Siberia where Navalny was poisoned. Over the years, Muchnik has seen many of his friends leave. Those that stay, he says, develop a kind of coping strategy that people remember from Soviet times. For a person who lived for a long time under the Soviet government, there's this concept of internal emigration. You live as an emigrant, and in fact you understand that the existing government is alien to you. You live in your world, with your circle of people, with your books, and you try to minimize contact with the outside world as much as possible. Of course, this is your country, but you can't change anything in it. Muchnik recited a poem by Soviet writer Varlam Shalamov, who spent years in the Gulag camps, to explain why people keep quiet. There's a collective memory of war and repression from Soviet times that he believes Russians want to avoid reliving. We plow in a graveyard just tickling the topsoil, afraid our blades may turn up, bones of dead people. For Muchnik, the poem encapsulates recent Russian history. 
Russia went through terrifying losses during the 20th century. People were killed in every family, every family. Many of Navalny's supporters are likely to relate to Muchnik's description of internal exile. Is there anyone left in Russia willing to oppose the Kremlin? Mikhail Khodorkovsky is a former oligarch who spent a decade behind bars in Russia. He was released in 2013 and has been living in exile since. We called him up in London, where he's now living. He believes the answer is yes, people will continue fighting. Some people are inclined to give up or just aren't ready to take risks. They'll distance themselves from politics or just leave the country. But there are always people for whom this is a calling and who are ready to take it up for one reason or another. I had my reasons, Navalny had his, and so on. In his view, the Kremlin's efforts to silence dissent and consolidate power actually have the opposite effect. They aggravate opposition sentiment. The authorities now are actually radicalizing the opposition. They've made it impossible to change the leadership via elections, since they've essentially nullified that process. The fate of this government will be decided either within the walls of the Kremlin, through a conflict among the elites, or on the streets. What it's doing today is pushing Russia to the brink of a violent change of power. If there's one thing modern Russian history teaches us, is that major political change in our country comes suddenly and unexpectedly. Here is Vladimir Karamorza. In 1905, Russia was engulfed in our first revolution, and the Tsar was forced to grant his subjects civic and political freedoms, and for the first time in our history, a parliament. At the end of January 1917, Lenin spoke to a group of Swiss Social Democrats in Zurich and ended with a famous phrase that my generation will not live to see the decisive battles of this coming revolution. The revolution started in six weeks. And I myself am old enough to remember August of 1991, when nobody at the beginning of the month predicted that by the end of the month, the Soviet regime would no longer exist. And when one of the most horrendous totalitarian systems in the history of humanity collapsed in three days. This is how things happen in Russia. If there's no way for citizens to change the government through the ballot box, then change is going to come from the streets. And if these people who are in the Kremlin today think that they will somehow be the only ones in history to escape this logic, well, I'm afraid they're in for a little bit of a surprise. We have this specific tendency for people to occupy their positions for 25 years and longer. This is Ekaterina Shulman. She's a respected political scientist in Russia. You might remember her from episode one. At the end of our interview, I asked her what happens next in Russia with Putin and with Navalny. Whatever happens in Russia happens for a long time. And especially if you don't have real political competition, those people who have managed to thrust themselves into this scene, they tend to stay there unless they die. So, one thing to remember. Nothing is over until somebody is dead. Nothing but death, not imprisonment, not immigration, not loss of popularity is the end. If you have seen the Game of Thrones, there's this principle you win or you die, yeah? It sounds so cruel, so Darwinistic, but really it can be turned the other way around. You do not lose until you are dead. So keep watching. <laughs> Never call anything the, the end of the day. Thank you for listening to the final episode of The Poisoning, a podcast by AFP. Спасибо всем. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. I'm Andrea Palachano. And I'm Jonathan Brown. 
From Moscow, we've been your hosts, and we worked with a team of colleagues in Paris. Antoine Boyer and Sarah Lou Lepers wrote this podcast with us. They also edited it and are the hosts of the French version, Le Poison de Poutine. Our editors were Michaela Cancela Kifa and Karim Taubi in Paris, Michael Mainville and Antoine Lambraschini in Moscow. Vasily Koloskov helped with translations. The original music was composed by Clémence Rolia and Nicolas Vert. Christophe Robert mixed the podcast, and the illustrations are by David Lory. Thank you again for listening to The Poisoning. If you liked it, tell your friends and rate it wherever you're listening. For more from AFP, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Paka! Dosidania!